Shit. All right, we are going live. We are being redirected currently. All right. We are live. I'm live. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our talk on race. Get out the vote. Uh, we're going to begin with our acknowledgement. The YWCA Lower Cape Fear serves the people located within the Lower Cape region. This land once thrived with life from indigenous peoples, known today as the Cape Fear Indians and the Wakamatsuan Indian people. Living in established settlements along the Cape Fear River and Lake Wakama, along with many other established sites and regions, we need to honor and protect these histor that history and these places. Indigenous people are not relics, they are still continuing to their talents and gifts amidst the backdrop of ongoing colonialism and oppression, they are worth celebrating. We hope our land acknowledgement statement will inspire us to stand with us in solidarity with Native nations. Thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, this episode is very, very important. It is Get Out Vote. Um, we are 62 days away from the 2020 election. The YWCA Lower K Fear does not endorse any candidate or political party. However, we understand the importance of voting. And today we are delighted to have some, an amazing panelist to discuss voting. I would like for you to welcome Deborah Maxwell, who is the new Hanover County NAAP president and community advocate. Welcome Pam Pearson, who is the general counsel and North Carolina Voter ID Coalition coordinator for, voter, for vote riders. Also welcome Catherine Hedgepath, the president of the Lower Cape Fear League of Women Voters. Welcome women, thank you so much for joining me. Nice to see you having us. So if we could just start out with um, some brief introductions and what your organization does around voter advocacy. I would love to start with um, Deborah, if you would talk about the NAACP and what the amazing things they're doing around voter advocacy, that would be amazing. Well, I thank you for this opportunity. Um, as you see, my pen says Black Voters Matter, and we try to get individuals who need um, further information about the voting process. We register, we educate, we advocate. We have presented two of three forums about candidates in this community because of COVID, it's hard for candidates to get out and people need to know. We will have Souls to the Polls on October the 18th and the 25th, which are two early voting dates. Um, we will also have uh, transportation provided to the polls. Um, just anything that's election focused, we are involved with. We also attend board of election meetings where people don't go because when early voting sites were increased before I go to the ladies, there are only 14 zip codes in this county but three of the early voting sites reside in one zip code. It's not that densely populated. So we need to do a better job of advocacy on that part also. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll go to Ms. Pam from Vote Riders. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. So uh, I'm Pam Pearson. I live in just North of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and as Janika said, I'm the general counsel, which means I handle everything legal, including um, any research on laws and so forth, which is obviously really integral to voting because we're a nationwide organization focused on voter ID. Um, we were founded in 2012 by an amazing woman named Kathleen Unger. Um, we are nonpartisan 501c3, so we don't advocate for any particular candidates. 
we actually don't advocate for any changes in the laws. Our role is a really focused one, which is to make sure if you live in a state where voter ID is required that you and you're an eligible citizen that you have the ability to get the ID that you need to vote. So North Carolina is a little funny. I'll talk more about it during my part of the speech, but I do wanna say right up front, voter ID law in North Carolina is not in effect. Um, there is not a requirement this year. So whether you're voting absentee or in person, you should not have to provide ID in order to be able to cast your ballot. Thank you so much for saying that. Everyone who is listening, voter ID is not required this year. So if you feel afraid you don't have one or are you nervous about not having one or are worried about the budget around getting somewhere to get access to it, it is not required this year. So we don't want to hear that as an excuse or as something that may keep you from voting. It is not required. All right, to Ms. Catherine. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Kath I'm Catherine Hedgepeth. I am the president of the Lower Cape Fear League of Women Voters. We represent New Hanover, Brunswick, and Pender counties, men and women. We've had men members since 1974, so it's not just women, regardless of the name. We are a political organization, but we are a nonpartisan organization like the NAACP and Vote Riders and the Y. We do not endorse a candidate, nor do we work with a political party um, on any uh, political work, but we do work actively to educate voters. We believe very strongly that you need to be empowered with real and honest information in order to vote, and we work hard to do that. We also hold forums for candidates um, in New Hanover and in Brunswick counties, um, and they will be coming up in starting in September. We have a national vote411.org site, which you can go to anywhere in the country. You put in your address and it will give you the candidates that are on your ballot. It will also link you to ways to register to vote if you need to and check on your status as a registered voter. So that's a really important website. We maintain it locally here, but it is also national. Um, because we are a national organization, we have some power behind it. So we've been very involved in advocacy on issues that we believe in, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the, the good things that I think about is, is because we were founded by women 100 years ago this year, we believe very strongly in the power of women to affect a more perfect democracy. And we work hard at all levels of government to make that happen. That's it. Thank you so much for sharing. So I want to share like a small personal story. Um, growing up, my grandmother, Leona Baker Farah, volunteered at the polling place every year. My grandmother would get dressed from head to toe. She would be at the voting place in her heels and her earrings and her makeup. And I just saw growing up how important for her it was to not just to vote, but to also volunteer. Um, and then also growing up, I voted with my parents. My parents would get up you know, hand in hand, walking to the polling place, and they would vote together. We would vote as a family. And then when North Carolina had kids voting, I was so excited because I got to then join in and my parents would vote over here. I would vote over here. And I really grew up with kind of a family experience around voting. So I have never question why should I vote because it's always been a part of our family from my grandparents to my parents to me to my now my family and my son so can we talk about the importance of voting and why should we vote and anybody can answer this question if you think about it no one gave us the vote every person at this screen had to fight to get the vote Women did not get the vote easily. 
Black people did not get the vote easily. Minorities of all kinds didn't get the vote easily. It was never given to us. We fought for it. And it really took not only the suffragists from the early 18th century up to 1920, but on into the 1960s and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 before we even began to be close to equality in voting. It's still a fight, it's not over. What your family's doing is fabulous and I wish everybody would do that. Well, and just um, following on what Catherine just said. So what, even uh, though we have what would you say to people who feel like their vote doesn't matter? You know, like my one vote doesn't matter. Well, it does. If you look at if you look at what happened in 2008 in North Carolina, um, Barack Obama won the state of North Carolina, and I say this not on a partisan basis; it's just factual. On with five votes per precinct, mm -hmm. five votes. I mean, I can throw a stick and find five voters with that stick. I mean, it's that small, um, and that's what the impact is. I mean, this is a very purple state. And what it means is that everybody's vote, especially this year, is really critical. Um, and I, I really, you know, like the league and um, others, you know, we really want everyone to vote, not just because it's a, an important thing that we all fought, that was fought for on our behalf, but because it impacts so much of our lives. And that means you don't just focus on the president and the, and the federal races, you focus on your state legislature, um, those folks make so many important decisions that have a real day-to-day -day impact on your life. And you have to, and you need to vote for the judges as well. They're really important. I mean, I come originally from a state where you don't elect the judges, they're appointed, but we've got what we've got. And I think that it's important to, there's great resources out there where you can find out information from the Bar Association and other groups that evaluate the judges' performance on a nonpartisan basis. It is important to vote because the Voting Rights Act was diluted. My two <laughs> other panelists have not lost any privileges, but many black men and women have been displaced through the voting process through the suppression of the location of the voting site, um, the timing of the site, the meetings of the Board of Elections. This has severely impacted marginalized people. So it's important because if you don't vote, that's an action while you think it's an inaction. Mm -hmm. it's one for the person you against. So I encourage everyone to, just like you, it was a family affair for me. We would go to Bronklin Hall, which is part of New Hanover High School, which was our voting site at that time. So it's been instilled in me and, and my daughter. So it's very important to understand that is nothing to take granted for granted because so much has been taken away. It has to be regained. Yeah. Um, I'll have one more thing on on the topic that yes, the devil is just referring to. There, there. North Carolina is a state that continues to have barriers that disproportionately affect affect voters of color, especially Black voters. Um, the reason we don't have to have ID this year is because the law that the legislature passed um, was the subject of two lawsuits, one in state and one in federal court. And both courts in examining the law and the basis on which it was designed found that there was a racial bias intentionally in the law, meaning that they chose specific IDs to be allowed or not allowed based on some data they got about what IDs black voters were less likely to have. And if they were less likely to have them, then it was more permissible. Yeah. The ones that they were most likely to have, they excluded, they specifically rejected amendments that would have made it easier for black voters in this state who are absolutely eligible to vote, to be able to vote. And that's, what's, that's what we're still fighting today. Um, and it's a shame because it shouldn't have to be this way. Um, everyone who's eligible should be able to vote. And we're just gonna have to work really hard in the coming years to make sure that the people who are elected have that same sentiment and, and approach the whole issue on a really even-handed basis and a fair basis. On a personal note, I can say I am very proud that the League of Women Voters, both in North Carolina and nationally, has been a party to those lost 
you have. Oops. We are um, very active on advocacy and fighting to get things changed, starting from with gerrymandering and the voter ID. We've worked very, very hard as advocates for all people. And I'm proud of that. Yes. And we, um, we actually have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one question that I see is uh, what, what do we know about local voting roles and have there been purges that we should know about? So I don't, I, I actually just became familiar with purges that have been taking place, which if, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is if you haven't voted in the past two federal elections, they can send you a letter um, kind of um, to to challenge your rights or your status as a voter. So it could be you, you moved addresses or you were sick or whatever the case may be. And then those names can then be purged from the record. And they, you know, then people actually, when they go to a polling place, their information is not there. They're no longer registered to vote, um, which in some cases, you know, can be considered as voter suppression because they think they are registered, but they're not registered, then they can't vote because they're not registered to vote. But there was a letter that was sent that could have been lost in the mail. So this uh, this person is asking, you know, should we be worried about this? I don't think there were a large number here. I have to check back with my friend who attends meetings when I don't, but the important thing is that you know how to check your voting status. All you got to do is go to ncbse.org.gov and key it, go into voting tools and you can see whether you are active, inactive, or not registered for yourself and your whole family. That's the North Carolina State Board of Elections.gov. And as of today, you're supposed to be able to get an online absentee ballot request form electronically and an and advantage of going in on early vote if you vote in that period between the 15th of october and halloween is that if you get up there to vote and they say you're not registered here you can register and vote immediately you will have to have an id that proves who you are your first time voter i believe that's still in effect um, yes. But the, uh, the rest of us don't need the ID. But if there's any question about your voting, if you vote early, you can then do it immediately. You can get yourself back on the rolls if you haven't had time to do the checking that Deborah just talked about, which really the Board of Elections has some great resources for us. It's a really good tool. Yeah, Catherine's right. And, they, and it, what's really important to know is if you get, we don't want people to panic if they get to the polls and it turns out they're on an active status because the BOE, the Board of Elections sent some mail to them and it came back undeliverable because they had moved. You can fix it with a lot of different IDs. A driver's license and a state issued ID are the, from the DMV are the best ones, um, but you can also use the last four of your social. And you can also use a lot of other things like a utility bill. And it doesn't have to be a paper bill because lots of us don't get those anymore. You can literally bring the bill up on your phone and show it to them and that will count as your ID. Um, so we don't want people to get panicked, but the good news is if you vote early during early voting, then you definitely have time to fix any problems and update your address and so forth. And, and that's good to know because some people, you know, when they go and they feel like they get turned away, they don't know what to do. You know, and if you definitely wait until voting day, your options are limited to, you know, how you can react. So I definitely also, we encourage early voting. Um, the next question is, what are the stats regarding early voting sites in North Carolina? Um, where can they find them? And where can they find early voting sites? There are nine sites in New Hanover County. Let's go to New Hanover County Board of Elections. They're on 230 Government Center Drive, Suite 8. Um, I can't tell you the phone number off the top of my head, but they have a Facebook page, <laughs> page. We share their information also. In fact, I picked up some early voting um, flyers that are in my car to distribute from them. 
um, it's all is printed everywhere. So um, I encourage that person to early vote, whoever it may be, because some of the sites for this year change. A crucial one is the site that used to be Cape Fear Community College is now the New Hanover Library on election day. So some people are gonna go those three blocks or four down the road and be at the wrong place. It happens, even though you're supposed to get notification, people forget. And there are some other sites that also change. So early voting is gonna be good because election day might be slightly confusing for people who are used to their old election places that have moved. Another good resource from so the League I of Women Voters. I also just got just, another think, um, question. Nico, uh, hang on just a second. I've got another good resource for you. No, go ahead. The League of Women Voters yeah. created a virtual okay. <laughs> campaign to educate people called Fearless Voters. And if you go to either our Facebook page or the web page for Lower Cape Fear with League of Women Voters, you can log into that and it gives you all the voting sites. It gives you a map to show them where they are in case that's close to you or not close to you. And it gives you hours for voting. So it's an excellent resource. It's called the Fearless Voter. The Fearless Voter. So just okay. wanted to that. Thank you. Voter. Yeah, I know we need all the information. The questions are popping in. Um, the next <laughs> question is, can you vote if you um, have been convicted of a crime? So from my understanding is if you have been convicted of a crime, you can vote, but if you are still serving time as a, like if you're still on probation with a felony or if you're still incarcerated with a felony that you cannot vote, but you can vote if you served your time, you can vote if, even if it's like a small misdemeanor, you can still vote. Um, anything I'm missing ladies? You just about got it all. And there's a flyer about that from Democracy NC, which is one of our partner organizations that will be presenting voter guides out in the next week or two, which we'll be distributing throughout the community. And you just, you got that correct. And that's in the state of North Carolina. So if there's someone listening who's in another state, each state has different rules about the offense. A misdemeanor, we can go register you in the jail and you can vote from the jail. Um, right. Felony? No chances. Um, that's North Carolina. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, another one more. Who been jailed? Who didn't know that it was a misdemeanor? It was done, and they could have registered. So that's a fallacy that the POs. You know who you are, POs. You need to let people know that when you release them. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I almost I almost want to say that could be um, for anybody who works in advocacy. That may be a great um, place to to advocate for when people are released to make sure that they know whether they can vote or not. Um, so, okay, can you use your tribal card as an ID? Is that an okay ID for um, Native Americans and, and our Indigenous brothers and sisters? Well, um, yes, you can, except remember, uh, we're going to say this as many times as we can. There is no ID requirement this time. Um, but if you were registering um, and you didn't have one of the other IDs, you could use that tribal ID to get registered. Okay. Can you vote? Um, oh, I'm sorry. What is it? Are there call centers that are encouraging voters to check their voting status? I'm not, I'm not aware of any call centers, but I'm pretty sure there have been lots of events around Wilmington, I can only speak for Wilmington, that have been advocating for voter registration. So um, I think if, if you feel like you need encouragement to check your voter status, uh, you know, let us know, reach out, um, and we can, I guess, be there to kind of help. Going to the Board of Elections gives you the best information. They can, you can check your status immediately right there. Yes. Okay. 
My next question is, what are some of the misconceptions around mailing mail-in voting information? So um, lately, some of the instances that I've heard have been organizations have been um, mailing out the, the uh, mail-in ballots or mailing out the registration to to receive your mail your mail-in ballot. Um, and people are confused behind what is happening. So I would love for someone to kind of clarify about the mail-in ballot process. Mail-in ballot request forms are very available. You can get them down from lowercase leaders in information table down by city hall. A lot of organizations, primarily political parties, have in fact been mailing out the request forms, but it's only the form and it should be totally blank when you get it. If it has been partially filled out by whoever gives it to you, throw it away because it's not legal. It has to be blank. You have okay. to fill out the request form and then you have to send it back in yourself with a valid signature to the Board of Elections. No one no one will mail out an actual ballot except the Board of Elections. That's the only place you're gonna get the actual ballot to return. And the biggest problem we've been hearing about with absentee ballots, which I'm sure uh, Deborah's heard a lot about, are ones that get rejected. And we've had a high percentage of rejected ballots in the last few years because people have not completed them totally. So it might be missing a signature, which is going to be on the envelope, not on the ballot itself. The ballot itself will contain no identifying information on the voter, but they have to be able to prove that it is in fact a valid vote. And so the envelope itself has to be signed. And then the Board of Elections compares that signature to the one you have on record to determine that it's really you voting. This is what makes it safe, along with the barcode they print on the envelope. So all the talk that you hear about ballots being sent out in great numbers illegally, that we're gonna have this flood of people who are not able to vote voting, it's not gonna happen, not in North Carolina. Their controls are really tight and they're very good about it. And I, I wanna encourage people to recognize this is a safe way to vote. The biggest problem being make sure you complete it and you have it signed and you have a witness who signs the envelope also to confirm that it was really you who did this ballot. No one cares how you vote, but they want to make sure it's really you who are voting. And that's really crucial about it. Now, does and, it have to be notarized or can it, it be, not. it doesn't have to be notarized. It just needs to be signed. Nope. Okay by right. someone who's not a candidate. So if your husband's running for office, he cannot sign your ballot. And the call-in number is 910-798-7343. 798-7343 is the special number at the New Hanover County Board of Elections. Okay. If you have any questions about absentee ballots, if you wish to request a form or anything like that, so I'm gonna say that number again, 798-7343. The problem is that I've been told, and this may occur, is that we receive these ballots from the state. So we have had a higher than normal request this year. So we are dependent on the allocation of what we receive from the state. They are not required to send us all of our absentee ballot requests at one time. They may send the first ones because we're over 6,000 from the last meeting uh, I will attend it. So that is something that possibly could occur. I'm hoping it doesn't, but it depends on what their capacity is for um, getting those to the individual boards of elections statewide. So after the 20th of September, for those who ordered early, if you don't have those, they yeah, encourage you to call the Board of Elections site to see what your status is about your absentee ballot request form. And to, to the point that you were, the question you were raising earlier about uh, what happens if people make mistakes and Catherine talked about how important it is to fill everything out. If, 
and to date it or whatever it is you have to do, just make sure it's really complete, especially the ballot envelope. Um, the State Board of Elections th throughout the state, I mean, I'm in a different county than, than the rest of you, um, but these are typically, these are career service people. These are not partisan party people. They are there to do a job to ensure that the elections are fair and safe and that every vote that should be counted gets counted. And um, I know in our county and statewide, there's been a commitment made to making sure if a voter makes a mistake, that they reach back out to the voter to let them know so that they can correct the mistake and vote a ballot that will be counted. And there's also been a lawsuit um, that has recently ruled that they are required to do that. So it's not just a general intention or statement of intention by the boards of elections. They're now required as due process for voters to notify the voters if there's an error with their ballot that might result in it not being counted. Now, of course, you have to be realistic about this. If you wait and vote late, the chances that they will have enough time to get back to you, let you know, and get you another ballot form so that you can re-vote is gonna be really small. So again, it really highlights the importance if you are gonna vote absentee, which is also called voting by mail, that you do it early so that you have a chance to correct any mistakes that you might make. And if you request yes, a hard That's copy. very important. This So if you are doing a mail-in, you need to do this early. Right. Yes. That's why churches okay. have been requesting and have received large bundles of absentee ballot request forms which they have distributed to their membership mm. already. Okay. Right. Okay. They're gonna start mailing on Friday. Those first ballots will go out on Friday of this week. Wow, okay. This is something we need to do now. Okay, speaking about the absentee ballot, um, they're asking about some of the deadlines. So we were talking about some of the deadlines. Um, I think it's late October, which is the last day. To, the, late in October will be your deadline for requesting a um, mail-in ballot. However, request it now. Uh, don't wait till October to do it. Correct. A Correct. ballot has to be completed and postmarked by election day, five o'clock on November 3rd, and it has to be received by the 6th of November. So that's a very short window for people. If you're requesting a ballot on the deadline, which is the, I think the 29th, you probably aren't going to get it in time. I would not count on that. We're really encouraging everyone to request it now and to think about mailing it back by the middle of October. So you give yourself plenty of time. Give yourself plenty of time. Um, deliver it to the Board of Elections. Correct, which is an easy uh, thing to do. Yeah. Or you can deliver it to the Board of Elections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. How can someone with little to no internet access check their voting status um, is um, a question that just came in. And I would probably say if they don't have um, internet access, their best way would be to contact the Board of, the board of Elections um, is going to be your safest and best route. Um, and we have put the Board of Elections phone number in the chat. So anyone who is watching this, you will be able to see that phone number in the chat as well. Um, will polling places have everything in different languages or will it only be in English? If it's any other language, it will be Spanish because we are not that diverse in this area. And I would have to inquire, I would think it will be available also in Spanish. Okay. Oh, the people in the comment section are agreeing with you all saying, uh, don't wait for the USPS. Uh, you, it might get to you too late. So they are affirming to do this early rather right. than later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Um, something that has ne not necessarily been new, but voter suppression. What does voter suppression look like? And how do we help voters who feel like their vote has been suppressed or their opportunity to be suppressed? How do we give them a voice? 
There are many different ways it has occurred. Um, sometimes it's like suppression, like we said about the location of the voting places, the, the hours of a place. One time it was the machines were not calibrated or seemed to have been set up wrong and people said, I pushed A and it came out B. That's a suppression tactic on a higher technical level. Um, there are just so many different ways and people have to let us know. There are people who would flag certain precincts. They go there and be intimidating the people or not wanting them to come in and vote. That's suppression. It's all suppression. Uh, we counter it by we have an 800 number usually always around with attorneys and law students do democracy and see, yes, I say them again, they're our partner. We do the leg work and they do the brain work usually this time of year. <laughs> and then we have election protection people at the polls when people volunteer for that class with them. So if someone has a dramatic or traumatic experience, we can go ahead and call that 800 number. A form of suppression, which you would not believe is that the disabled parking space not being assigned properly for that they say disabled person to get in there and vote so their rider might just drive off. Suppression is when the van pulls up from the nursing home and the clerk, the ju judge comes out and tells them they can't vote there. Those are all, there's so many different ways to vote is suppressed. And all of these have happened in New Hanover County. Maybe not this cycle, but I've seen it at one point or another. You also mentioned Spanish, and we have a significant Hispanic Latino population in this area. And if polls are unable to get enough bilingual poll workers, it can make it very difficult for someone who's coming in to vote and only speak Spanish. And that's something we can advocate for with the Board of Elections, that how they do their recruiting. I think Deborah hit on a very important thing is where they place their polling places. That can really either encourage or discourage someone. If it's far from a bus line and you have to walk or you're in a scooter, you're not gonna go vote because it's gonna be very, very difficult for you. Transportation is a huge issue that without anyone being aware of it can suppress a vote because it's not available. If polls are not accessible to people, they will not vote. And that's why we are providing transportation and that's why after this election, I need the people of New Hanover County to make sure that this does not happen again. Um, three, three voting places in 28412. What happened to 01, 03, 11? The schools are not open. So all those schools could have been a site. I mean, that might have been the bone of contention initially, and I don't think they're, are they going back? I'm not keeping up with the school system. Oh, so they're going back. And then they will be back then, yep. And then they'll close again. Okay. <laughs> and they could have been a site. They could have been a site. Well, and I'm just going to add one more thing, yep. which isn't the same kind of barrier, but it has the same ultimate effect, is that confusion, um, which is really rampant these days, um, because we're all shut in our homes and, you know, there's all this information. If you're on the internet, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of the information isn't accurate. And the right. problem is the more confused people are, the more likely they are not to vote at all. So we had a really strict voter ID law back passed back in 2015 that was in effect at the beginning of the 2016 election cycle. So in the primaries, for the first time since I've lived in North Carolina, I had to show ID when I went to vote. But then the courts held up the law again based on the racial bias inherent in their motivation for choosing certain IDs. And then we didn't have to have ID in the general election. Well, they did a study about voter behavior and they found that voters were deterred from voting when they had to provide ID, even if they had ID and they were eligible to vote. They were mm -hmm. worried about it because there was so much confusion going on. And here's the worst part. There was a further deterrent effect in November. So there were additional people, keeping in mind, there's no ID required in that November election. There were additional people who did have ID and who were eligible vote, to vote, who didn't go because they were concerned. They know that you have to sign something. They didn't wanna make a mistake and get in trouble. 
and so they don't show up. And you know that's what we're really fighting for this year because people don't need ID. <laughs> Vote Riders is really focused on trying to clear up those misconceptions to make sure people know exactly what's going on. And unless you fall into that very tiny category of being a first time voter in the state and you didn't provide ID when you registered, nobody should be asked for ID. And if you are, you should raise your hand and you should ask one of the precinct officials to explain why you're being asked to provide ID because it's not a requirement this year. Yes. Okay, this question is for Deborah. Uh, you mentioned that the New Hanover County NAACP is providing transportation to the polls. Um, will they also be providing transportation for um, people who may need to turn in their absentee ballot? Um, and I would say um, you don't have to turn in your absentee ballot by hand. You are welcome to mail it back in. So I don't think the NAACP is going to be providing that transportation. Mm -hmm. However, if you do need transportation to the polls, if you need transportation to the polls, please contact the NAACP. And if, that, if they wish to take their ballot personally to the Board of Elections versus mailing, we will do that. Um, I can understand oh, wow. if they depend, but they, they better have it in their hand. We're not going to um, Walmart. Um, <laughs> We're not going to shop for groceries. <laughs> Deborah, is that for the uh, early voting as well as November? Yes, we, we our primary. Third or just election day? Is um, No, this is during early voting. That's the primary thrust. We want people to early vote especially with the health status of a pandemic, you really all need to consider the early vote because that is a greater propensity for you to have a lighter day and nine places on election day. You only got one place to vote. That's the precinct you live in. You cannot go anywhere else. So if you see a long line at the government center, you can run over to the North campus, but you can't do, or the Northeast library, but you cannot do that on election day. So it's best to early vote between October the 15th and Halloween. Because if you don't vote, the trickle is going to be on you. Mm. I have uh, someone asking, how do we get more polling places in rural areas like Columbus County? That the polling places were determined by the population density. Of, of the counties and the locations of availability like ours. We don't have enough open buildings that can be utilized within the city. Um, all of our parks don't have a building that could be a voting location like Brunswick County. So this is something people on parks management need to look at and we need to have more places. In Columbus, that person first need to go to their board of election meetings. Second, find out who represents them by their political representation and speak and see where these places are because they will thrive on community input on what the Board of Elections does. This is one of the most important meetings in the county that nobody attends. Uh, and when are the Board of Election meetings? They are posted on each county's website in New Hanover okay. County. They are on a Thursday at four o'clock, and I thank them for that. It used to be two o'clock when I was working. Um, <laughs> and each county has a different date and time, and by law, they only have up to, it's less than a week to give notice, so I would suggest you look. Uh, they look, call their county board of election. Each one has a different date and time. Like Brunswick will list all of theirs. Um, for the whole okay. year, if any specials come out, then they would throw it under their previous director. I don't know what their new director is still on. Okay, okay. Um, and one of the last questions I have or comment is about um, voter-owned elections and about the North Carolina public campaign uh, for financing programs. So I came across this information uh, by watching this documentary called um, Rigged. Um, and they were talking about, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, it's, a, it's a really good documentary. It's uh, actually free to watch on their website. 
But one of the things that we're talking about were campaign funds. And um, one of the things that North Carolina is fighting to get, is fighting to continue to do is to have public campaign financial financing options. So people who don't have millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, if they really are serious about entering the political race, they can have access to these funds so that they can run. Um, there are stipulations behind it, like you have to be able to still raise money and do all of these things, but um, creating more candidates that look like the population creating more candidates that are more diverse. So it's not just all white men representing a whole county that's full of, you know, black and brown people, women, uh, non-gender conforming people. Um, and, and so I think it's also important that as we are pushing um, people to vote, that we also remind people that um, we need people like you and I on some of these boards to help with uh, changes to the board of elections to help with changes to our school board um, and that we're not asking you to have millions of dollars to do campaign funds but you know there is a public campaign fund that will help you so please also remember that um, there are we all can play a part in our community we can all play a part in reshaping our community and and having our community emerge what it should be and how it can be. Um, but we all have to play a part and some of us have to be on those boards. So I, I am also encouraging anyone watching to uh, to, to be on those boards and, and um, access that fund. Um, we are actually in our last 10 minutes. So before we are over, I really just would like to um, open up the, the floor for any last minute thoughts, um, any other announcements that you may have. And so we will start um, with Ms. Pam. Right, thank you. Um, I really enjoyed this format. It's, uh, it's fun to be able to address different questions and know that we're really presenting on what people are interested in. Um, I will just say, putting aside the fact that we do not have to have ID this year, I am spending a huge amount of time every single day doing the work of getting people ID because one thing we know is that people need ID for other reasons than voting. Um, and eventually you will need ID to vote in North Carolina because that's what we've done with the constitution. So hopefully it will be a much more accessible ID requirement. Um, but in the meantime, I'm working with people who um, need ID for other reasons. They need it to get housing. They need it to get um, health care or benefits. Um, or they get a job and they need the ID to get onboarded to that job because lots of uh, employers want you to prove who you are. And so it can be really expensive and it's definitely complicated, especially if you're trying to get an ID from the DMV. Um, and so I'm working with those folks every day. I'm working with homeless people. I'm working with returning citizens and um, I have to say it's really fulfilling work, but I'm really grateful for the change and the empowerment that I feel like it gives people to know that they're, they're taking a step to help move their lives forward. And um, so I will share just my contact information. Yes, please do. I do this. I don't know if it'll work. Oh, um, I'll just say, I'll just put it in the in the chat, I'll put them on Facebook. So um, what I will say is you can just go to our website, which is www.voteriders, V-O-T-E-R-I-D-E-R-S.org. Um, and there's a helpline you can call or text. You can send us information through the email. You can use our chat bot to get information. It's on all 50 states um, for both uh, voting and uh, voting by mail. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Pam. And Catherine, you are next. I'd like people to remember that there are three important numbers that are very important to all of us as citizens. And the first number is the number of people that are actually eligible to vote, which is a very large number in this country. And the second number is the number of people who are registered to vote, which is not as large a number in this country. And sadly, the third number is the number of people who actually vote. And that's an even smaller number because a lot of people have great intentions that they're gonna vote, 
and then they don't do it. And that hurts all of us. So in North Carolina, we are very fortunate to have a real advantage that we have many ways for people to vote. You can wait till November 3rd. A lot of people like to go stand in those lines and say they're part of the process, but you don't have to. You can, you can do it absentee. You can mail in that information and you can vote in that two week period of early voting, which is in a lot of different sites and is the most accessible for all of us if you wanna go vote in person. So I'd like to see those numbers come closer together. I'd like to see us be among the countries in the world where all of their citizens take an interest in what's going on and who's governing them and the decisions that are made for us by people that we elect. We elect them from the school board and the city council and the county commissioners right up to the state and the national level. But we're the ones who have to do that. So think about being one of those people who actually goes to the polls and votes. Thank you so much, Catherine. And last but not least, Ms. Deborah. I thank the ladies and I thank you also, Ms. Palmer, for this opportunity to engage in meaningful dialogue about the importance of your vote. For people who look like me, someone is hunting you down. They used to be on the streets with a policeman, but right now everybody is hunting you down for your vote. So be careful where you take it and be careful where you use it. And if you think I'm joking, I can name over five organizations that are paying people just in this county to come and look for you and your vote. So therefore, your vote matters, you matter, and you know I feel like you matter. All you gotta do is go down Oleana Dawson if you don't think I don't believe you matter. So to every voter, things are wrong in Wilmington and New Hanover County. So I hope that you come out and be on the side of right and vote right to make this county what it should be. Because right now it is not what it should be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I love your fan. Can <laughs> I get, I'm gonna have to come find you so I can give me one. one in the car for you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> and I just, uh, in my, in my last couple of minutes, of course, we would like to thank Velva Jenkins, our CEO here at the YWCA Lower Cape Fear, who um, really wanted us to do something around voter advocacy. And the YWCA will be working towards more voter advocacy and will be partnering hopefully with more of our organizations to help. Also, um, we got two really important questions that I think is, is uh, should, we should answer. The first one is, do you have to be disabled to do curbside voting? If you roll up and don't tell them, and you didn't hear me say that, but everybody did, no. <laughs> In these COVID times, I might be disabled. You can't prove it. They don't, they don't ask for a certificate of disability when you pull up. Yeah, they don't. Thank you for that answer. And then can someone deliver a relative's ballot? Um, and this was mainly for someone who has an elderly parent or someone who may be disabled or have a disability. Can they drop off the ballot themselves? I mean, for someone else. Uh, if they're the ones who did it, I believe, Ms. Catherine, but I'm gonna have to get back you with you to make sure. I happened. think the answer is that only immediate family members can do it. Right. So that for me, I could do my mother's my husband's, my kids. And I don't okay. think anything further distant than that is permitted. Okay. And the safer thing is drop it in the mail because you know that's going to get there. Early. Early. Not late. Early. Early. Right. Yes. Early. <laughs> well, I thank you so much, ladies, for just coming together with me to have the dialogue. Again, voting has always been very important in my family. And I think, um, you know, Voting is important for us, especially when we serve in roles for advocacy. You know, you can't advocate if you're not willing to vote. I just, I just think that that's like a, it doesn't go together. 
Um, and, you know, here at the YWCA, I, I am in an advocacy position. And so we have to discuss voting. We have to discuss voter suppression and intimidation. And we have to stand in solidarity for those who may be afraid to vote. Um, and if you are afraid to vote or feel intimidated, there are people you can contact. Contact us so we can, we'll vote with you. We'll drop you off. Um, mm -hmm. We'll make sure you are safe. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's why you have organizations like Vote Riders, like the NAACP, um, like the League of Women Voters to stand with you and to assist you. So again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'd like to invite you next month to join us for our talk on race, where we will be discussing public safety. So I would, yeah, public safety. So uh, please, please, please come and join us this month. And thank you so much for your time. You ladies have an amazing day. And thank you. remember, go vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Actually.